Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ben. I work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, this talk is kind of a, uh, an idealism around uh, based on an existing uh, library for uh, for the Raspberry Pi, and I want to see uh, uh, the idea of it being taken taken further and um, moving forward into into other areas. Um, so the Raspberry Pi is a single board computer that provides you a set of GPIO pins. These pins allow you to connect up to electronics and real world. Uh, uh, applications and devices, um, and they're, they're a simple interface to um, pro to programming devices and re reading values and sensors and controlling things in the real world. Um, prior to uh, the library that I, that I, I created, uh, there was a there were several low level libraries which you just talk to the pin. So you t if you've ever used an Arduino or something like that, you do a lot of kind of turning pins on and off and reading the state of pins. Uh, the way uh, my library GPIO zero works. Is, is all uh, implementations uh, within device classes. So you, in, you create an instance of an LED, for instance, and it ha provides you all the things that you want uh, in, in human terms to, to an LED to be able to do. So an LED uh, is just a light. So you have on, off, toggle, blink. You can read its value as well, and, and things like that. So that's just a really simple example. And this, is, um, uh, this all kind of stemmed around some um, Myself and uh, uh, my friend Dave Jones created this library together. Uh, it was inspired by uh, Dan Pope's Pi Game Zero, which is a zero boilerplate uh, version of Pi Game for making, uh, making games with Python. Um, and we took the same kind of idea. So we wanted to minim minimize the amount of code you have to write to make something happen. So in Pi Game Zero, in, in just a few lines of code, you can get something on the screen that you can control with the keyboard and move around. And your uh, implementation of your game becomes uh, very centered around the actions of what uh, what is going on in the game, the actors in the game, uh, not about implementation of how these these things should in, uh, should should work in the uh, in, in the underlying in an underlying sense, and the same applies here with GPO. So rather than writing out your implementation or copy and pasting an implementation of how to read something complicated like an ultrasonic distance sensor, where you send off a signal and wait to uh, have a signal back on a different pin, and you're reading pin values and Doing calculations, uh, you actually just create an instance uh, of a, a distance sensor device, and you read its value or read its distance. Um, and um, they all have um, so that it was intended for use in education because we used to teach with a low-level library, uh, teaching teachers how to do physical computing. And there's an awful lot of code that you had to write to be able to just just do the basics, and it was very. Uh, very difficult for them to f have the confidence to actually move forward and do more complex projects. But if you can write in a Pythonic, uh, Pythonic way uh, with you know, simple guessable, guessable API, um, commonly used names, and sensible default values, um, it's a simple introduction that allows you to uh, progress along a smooth learning curve. And um, we, we went for a kind of a multi-paradigm approach, which is what, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on in the talk. So. There isn't just one way um, to do something, like a, a procedural way. There's uh, various different methods you can use. The same way uh, in Python, you can start doing while loops and if statements and move on to writing your own classes or writing your own functions or uh, using functional tools and things like that. Uh, and it's very extendable. So uh, if there's a device that you've got that we haven't got an implementation for, it's very simple to build on existing classes and uh, write your own or even uh, write other devices that perhaps aren't uh, tied to GPIO pins, but have them control, um, be controlled in the same way or control other things in the same way. Uh, so GPIO Zero supports all the kind of basic um, electronic components and uh, a few sort of add-on boards and more specialized components. Um, there's a huge device hierarchy, so everything um, kind of builds on, um, uh, builds on uh, other things. So looking at the, the sort of what I consider the four main different paradigms. So in, a, in the, the most basic sense, if you want to have an LED uh, light up when you press a button, this is one way, uh, a really great way to introduce a, a, new, a teacher who's new to this or a child who's, who's new to this or any beginner is to write a while loop that has an if statement. So if the button is pressed, turn the LED on, else turn it off in a while loop. And if that's all, you, if that's all your script is doing, it doesn't matter that you'll stick there in a while loop. A, sl a slight uh, um, variation on that is to use procedural but with a blocking. So rather than continuously asking if the if and going one way or the other, you wait for the button to be pressed, 
and it will just sit and uh, block at, at that point until the button is pressed. Then turn the LED on, wait for it to be released and turn it off, um, which, which has its benefits as well. You kind of have a control flow rather than continually uh, asking. And then you have uh, an event-driven approach. So you assign an action to the button being pressed and the button being released. Now this does exactly the same thing, but using uh, callbacks. So a threaded callback would be fired to fire the LED dot on function. You provide it. You can provide any function. It doesn't have to be a uh, a GPS error. So it's just something uh, something that's callable. So you can write your own custom function. Have it um, have it fire that uh, when you press a button or something in, in, as well. And the final example. So we've, you'll see each of these has reduced the uh, the number of lines needed. Um, but this one kind of takes a bit of explanation. In a way, it's much simpler in that there's just one line defining the behavior. So you're setting the source of the LED. So it's saying, from the LED's point of view, where do I get my values from? And the, uh, the button dot values is, a, is an iterator yielding uh, its current value continuously in the background. Um, so the way, the way that values work, so we have uh, every device has a dot value property. You can read whether it's an input or an output device. Um, so here I'm creating not an LED, but a PWM LED, which is just an LED component that you're, you want to be able to control the brightness, uh, bringing it up and down from 0 to 1, not just on off. Um, so, the, um, so an LED's value would be true or false, but a PWM LED value is, uh, is a float 0 to 1. And uh, now if I, t I can run LED on and then read the value again, and I've got 1.0. I can also just set it to 0, and that's the same as running LED off. So you, you can't set, a, uh, a, say, a button's value. It has to be pressed for the, for the, for the value to be changed. But uh, an output device, you can have its value set. But you could always read the, uh, the, the value of a, an input device. So if you create a, a PWM LED, for instance, and a potentiometer, so a, a rotary dial, uh, which also has a value of 0 to 1 as you slide the, the, the dial around, um, you could read the LED value and see that it's 0, read the potentiometer value, and it's that sort of roughly around, around halfway. Uh, and what you could do is you could say LED value equals the pot value. So you set that once. The LED brightness is now set to that sort of roughly half, uh, half brightness, but whatever the, the potentiometer is at that particular time. And then what you find yourself uh, doing is putting that in a loop to say, well, I want it to continuously update. And that's where the idea of having uh, source and values ca came from. So output devices have a, a dot value, a dot values, which is uh, uh, an iterator constantly yielding uh, the current value. And then any device that can have its uh, value set has, also has a source. And you can just uh, pipe that straight into there just by setting the source property uh, to equal any iterator, to be honest. You give it a list of values and a delay, and it will, um, it will iterate over them. But if you give it um, another device's dot values, it will constantly iterate over those, um, keeping those, uh, those two devices paired, essentially. And so you end up with, uh, with this. So an LED and a button um, paired up in that way. You can also process the value in between. So you could take the set of values, uh, um, apply a function to each value before you pass it into the source. So if you wanted to, say, do the opposite of um, the, the LED uh, is lit up by the button press, you could have the LED is, pr is on until I press the button, and then it goes off. You could negate that with a function in between. Uh, we actually provide a set of common tools for things like that that you would want to do. You can write your own custom functions which do this. Uh, it's all bog standard, uh, just passing values around uh, with iterators. But we provide a bunch of source tools um, within gpl0.tools, uh, such as negated um, and various others. So if, you want to, if you've got a value uh, that's, say, 0 to 1, but you need to turn it into a Boolean, then you just put, pa pass it through the Booleanized function. You can clamp, invert, negate, uh, delay them, uh, quantize them, smooth them, scale them. You can do all sorts. And you can combine these as well. You can even um, have some source tools which uh, combine, combine mul multiple sets of values. So you could, have, uh, you could have two input devices, which some function takes those two values, does something to them, and passes it into an out output device. Uh, so there's, um, and there's things like. Uh, the other uh, uh, combining tools are uh, things like all, any, uh, averaged, multiple, and multiplied, and summed. Uh, so you could have, for instance, 
a, um, an LED that's only lit when two buttons are both pressed. You could have the and, you know, the all values, the and of those two buttons. Um, and you can also provide uh, artificial uh, sources, so have a function which gets passed into the source, but it's not coming from a GPO device, it's just coming from some function that, uh, that isn't connected to a device. So things like if you wanted to pass in uh, cos values or sine values or, or random values, or define your own, um, your own function that just provides a set of values from some artificial source. Um, we also provide a few other classes which are we call internal devices, which have all the same properties that the, the other GPIO devices have, the other de devi device classes. Um, but they're, they're, these are um, not after artificial, but they're just not related to GPIO things. So time of day, for instance, Here's an example. So I've got a pet tortoise at home. Uh, we've got a, a, a lamp, a heat lamp, that needs to be on for a certain amount of time during the day. Um, and it's, the lamp is connected to something called an Energini socket, which is a remote control socket that you can send a radio signal to, and it will uh, turn on and off the, the actual wall socket uh, from the Raspberry Pi. And that's just controlled by a few GPIO pins. Uh, so here I create an, um, an instance of an Energini connection to an Energini socket, uh, which I call lamp. That's, that's the um, representation of what it's controlling. It's, the, it's controlling the lamp. Uh, and I've got a daytime object, uh, an object I'm calling daytime, which represents the hours between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I set the source to the... So it's a bit the, the time of day object is a bit like a button in, the, in that it's either active or it's not active. Um, uh, the same way a button is either pressed or not. It's the same kind of same kind of idea. So, but it's just like a button that is is or pressed for those hours of the day and then released. Um, so th this is one example of uh, how you could use that to to, to control a, a lamp using the using daytime. Uh, another one. Uh, so we have um, CPU temperature. So you can read the CPU temperature of the device of the, um, the direct like the the temperature of the the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and we have um, something called LED bar graph. So that's when you've got a series of LEDs in a, in a row, and rather than be, you can actually, you can have um, you can have them controlled arbitrarily. So you have a, an LED board, and you just say you could turn them on at any uh, in any interval. Uh, but if you want them to act like a bar graph, so they can only go from from one end up to the other, and lighting uh, being lit up, uh, then use the LED bar graph, which is a really effective way. If you've got say ten LEDs in a row. Um, and you pass in the value 0.5, it will light the bar graph up to half of the LEDs. So here I'm using um, the LEDs will always be a representative of the current CPU temperature of, of the Pi. So you could see, visualize like the, um, the temperature rising as you, change, as you do stuff uh, with applications on the device. Um, Another one, so ping server, it just, uh, again, it's either active if it, can, if it can do a successful ping or inactive if it can't. Uh, so here I'm using source delay, which delays how often it should be reading that. So I only want it to ping Google every 60 seconds. Um, and I'm also setting, so I've set the green to match the uh, Google values, um, but it's only looking every, uh, every minute. And then the red uh, is, rather than coming from another input device, it's just negating whatever the green is. So the, either the green uh, LED is on or the, or the red LED is on, according to whether it can access Google. And you can uh, define your own. So this is one way of doing it, is actually providing a class that subclasses uh, the internal device class and just implements how it reads its value. So I'm just going to read, uh, here's just reading from a file um, and uh, that just contains an integer. So you could, you could have a, uh, some sort of interface that writes to a file, either writes a zero or a one. Um, and sets some LED to, to match whatever there is in that file, for instance. You could also implement this as a function that just yields, uh, yields that value as well, but uh, that's just an alternative. So th there's a, a separate library um, written by Martin O'Hanlon um, called Blue Dot. So this is, um, uh, it comes with a, an Android app for your phone that you can, uh, you get a big blue dot on the screen, and you can either use it like a, a push button. So when you press the button on the app, it Bluetooth is Bluetooth connected to your to your Pi, and you can read whether the button is pressed or not in real time. But it also acts like a joystick as well. So you can rotate your finger around the D-pad and retrieve the X and Y and the angle and th and things. So you can use it to do simple things like you could control an LED just by pressing the the Android app, um, or you could use it as a D-pad to control, say, a robot. And it's really simple to do that because 
Uh, Martin uses the same um, same kind of style of as, as, of of API as uh, GPI Zero does, so it plugs in really well together. So you create an instance of your blue dot connection. Uh, here's the exact same examples of the LED and button I did before, uh, but, the, but the button has been replaced with this blue dot controller, exactly the same API. So you've got, if the blue dot is pressed, turn the LED on, wait for press, uh, when pressed, and then source and values, he implemented uh, the, the source values thing. So. GPIO Zero is uh, a cross-platform um, library, so you can, it's distributed via apt in Raspbian and, uh, and Ubuntu PPA, and, uh, and obviously through PIP. Uh, so you can run it on Raspberry Pi operating systems and access the GPIOs directly. You can also run it on a PC and Mac, and there's various reasons you would do that. So one thing we did was initially we um, built the library on top of the low-level library I mentioned that we used to use to teach kids and, and teachers uh, how to do stuff, which is RPI GPIO. Um, the guy who wrote that library, uh, Ben Croston, he, he wrote it to, as a way to um, control his beer brewing process. And he, he runs a, a, a beer brewing business, and he, he sponsors Pipe on UK uh, often uh, um, because he, he used Python to, uh, to, to do that. And he wrote the library, which is what we ended up using as a teaching tool, which is really cool, uh, way of something like that coming out of the community. Uh, but we built on top of that uh, initially, and it was just directly tied to RPI GPIO. Uh, the GPIO zero was just an abstraction on top. But then uh, later on, we made, it a, a, made a way of uh, providing multiple hot, uh, swappable backends. So you can say, well, actually, I want to use this. I want to use the GPIO zero API, but this particular library underneath, because it has this feature or this, this other thing that I like. So there's a couple of other libraries. Um, one in particular is PyGPO, I'm going to go into next, which allows, uh, allows remote connections, which is uh, a, a really useful way of being able to control things from your PC over, over the network onto another Pi. Uh, we provide a, uh, a native pin implementation just bundled with GPIO Zero that's quite limited but, uh, and experimental, but it's um, just a way if you don't have one of those other pin libraries, you can just use that. Um, and mock as well. So we have a test suite in the, uh, in the library that just mocks, um, there's no actual pin interactions going on, just purely, purely mocks it, purely in Python, which is really useful for both in, in our test suite and for personal testing as well. You can validate that your code runs without having access to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so here's an example of how uh, mock works. So you just set a, uh, the pin factory, as we call it, to, uh, to mock in a, an environment variable. Uh, run your Python shell or your Python file, and you write exactly the same code that you would on a real Raspberry Pi. There's no warnings or errors or anything. It just um, the, the the underlying pin object that's connected to the device uh, is just a mock pin, which just stores the pin state in uh, memory. So it's just flashing an LED and reading its value. Not very interesting. The next one just demonstrates that you can connect mock devices together. So you can you can verify that um, if you have a mock button and a mock LED, your um, your LED's value should change according to, to, to the button value, which you can tell to, to drive high and low um, to simulate the button being pressed, um, which is quite useful. Um, so the PyGPIO library is a, a really good library written in C. Um, the author's name is Joan, and she um, uh, does a really good job of uh, implementing all sorts of different um, GPIO and and other communication uh, protocols in, uh, for Raspberry Pi in this library. Uh, really well documented library as well. Uh, and this, the way that it works is it runs uh, on the Raspberry Pi as a daemon that can uh, accept socket connections. So you can give it remote commands. If you, if you open up, uh, give it uh, permission to, then you can have it receive commands from, from another device. So if you uh, run with these in, uh, environment variables, setting the, the pin factory and the IP address, uh, then you can actually have the exact same code you would run on a Pi, but running remotely. So give it, uh, give it an IP address and it will run. If that Pi is running Pi GPIO and actually accepting connections, then you can just write the same code and it will do that over the network. Uh, another way you can do it, instead of using the environment variables, is um, create your factory objects in line in your code, which may also means you can have uh, multiple ones. So you can have you can control multiple devices over the, the same sets of pins, but on different pies within the same script. So you can have a sensor on one pie in one room controlling a, a device in another room. 
Um, and that's, uh, yeah, so it's an example of blinking an LED uh, on a remote Pi. And this is one where, so the default pin factory, uh, unless you set it in the environment variables, is, is on the Pi itself. So this script is being run on a Pi. And so the LED here on 20, pin 22 is the, uh, is the Pi's own pin 22. But the button is on another Pi's pin 22. So the, the LED and the button are, in, are on different devices there. But one is explicitly set to a, another pin factory, which is a remote Pi. One is just the local, the local pin. Um, and another use for this is we provide um, an x86 um, distribution of our, of our Linux distribution, um, Raspbian. So we call the Raspberry Pi desktop for x86. So you can run this on your PC and Mac. Uh, either live boot it from a, from a, a disk or stick uh, or actually install it on your machine. And this, the, the good thing about this is it's, like, it's a bit like an educational distribution. So you've got, but for programming, so you've got all the programming tools and, and things that come with Raspi and the stuff that we want um, Raspberry Pi users to have access to. Uh, you have all that installed and, and, re and ready to use. Um, this also means you get the GPIO libraries and things like that. Now, obviously, if I hadn't told you what, what I've just gone through about the remote pins and th things, you, uh, you would think, well, there's no point having access to those because you, you're on a PC, you don't have access to the pins. But uh, a new addition um, allows you to plug in a Pi Zero, which is the smaller form factor, cheaper version of the Raspberry Pi. And you can just plug it in with a USB cable um, and no SD card. So you don't actually have to install Raspbian on, on the SD card. You can just boot it over USB using a, a OTG. And you can tell it that you want to access the GPIO pins. So when you when you plug it in, <clears throat> this dialog pops up. Oh, we've plugged in a Raspberry Pi. What do you want to do with it? If you say you want to use it as a GPIO board, uh, it will boot a cop copy of Raspbian into the RAM on the Pi Zero from your PC, uh, boot it, run the Pi GPIO daemon, and then it's, um, it's provided as an IPv6 uh, gateway to, to the device. So you can create a pin factory on uh, the, the reference to the IP address the same way you would a remote Pi, but it's actually just going down the USB cable. Um, so it's a nice way of kind of doing uh, sort of plug and play Raspberry Pi GPIO stuff just from your PC. This is also um, provided uh, uh, in a PPA for Ubuntu, so uh, you can install that and run it on Ubuntu. And uh, we're looking into getting this ported to Windows and Mac as well at some point so that uh, you'd be able to do GPIO things uh, directly from your, from your PC and Mac. Uh, without installing or, or live booting the Raspberry Pi desktop, which you can do now. Uh, this is a really, really cool way of doing it. It means things like uh, code clubs and coded dojos and Raspberry Jams and things um, have an easier way of getting access to being able to run workshops doing this kind of thing, the physical computing GPIO stuff. And so, yeah, what I wanted to go on to was um, the idea that you could use uh, this kind of interface, this, uh, this simple interface, this Pythonic API, and these... Um, these different um, programming paradigms that have been provided for the, the different ways of accessing and describing uh, what is going on in your system um, that could be, uh, could be used elsewhere, regardless of how it's implemented. You could provide something like a garden light class, which control the actual physical light in your, um, in your garden, attached to, say, a motion sensor and a light sensor. So here's an example where we use the combining uh, source tool, all values, to say, well, Take the negated light values, so it means where if, if read it whether that is dark, and so when, when there's dark, darkness and motion, both, both darkness and motion, then the garden light should be on. And that's just a one line uh, thing describing the, the behavior of that system. Uh, but you could write it using one of the other paradigms as well. Uh, with the idea that uh, it doesn't matter how you talk to your garden light or your light sensor or motion sensor, uh, but those uh, that implementation could just be within the class, and you have you provide these as long as you provide like blue dot, as long as you provide the um, the means to um, uh, to to provide sorry as long as you provide the uh, the API that uh, GPIO zero devices have so the value the values the source uh, the is is pressed and when pressed and all that kind of thing, then you have uh, the ability to write code like this. So uh, there's a a series of um, Devices you can get uh, with Z-Wave controllers, they're called, that 
uh, a lot of people have uh, in increasingly in, in the home for uh, controlling various things around, around their house. So things like uh, their uh, alarm system or their um, irrigation system, um, scenes in different rooms, you know, uh, the kind of things you get with Hue light bulbs and that kind of thing, um, smart devices around the home uh, that are on the same protocol called Z-Wave. So you have a, you have a server that, uh, that's on your network and talks to all these devices. Um, so a friend of mine has, um, has taken the idea of GPI-0 and this, this kind of interface um, and written an async IO uh, implementation of the source values kind of protocol. Um, which means that you can declare in, in simple Python terms how you want the things in your, around your house to behave. So he has things, rules set up for things like, uh, I want the, the you know, bathroom lights to come on when, you know, and he's got things like humidity sensors and um, light sensors and timings and, and various other things that he, he just decides how he wants them all to behave in his house. Um, the good thing about the async IO implementation is that it's uh, sort of, push-based rather than uh, continuous polling. So uh, whereas in GPI-0, the, the devices are, every, every source, um, every time a source is set, it's, um, it's actually running a background thread. So there's lots of threading and um, message, sim very simple threads, just pass passing, um, passing data values around. Um, but it just means that they're constantly being sent, regardless of whether they've been updated or not. So if you're polling, let's say we had a light switch implement, uh, implementation, it's constantly sending off, 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 off to the, to the, to the, uh, the lights. Uh, whereas if you, if you do it push-based, then and not until you, um, uh, you, you press the button and change, change the setting of the light that, uh, that, it, that it sends over the new value. Um, it would be interesting to investigate um, implementing this kind of um, uh, this kind of implementation into GPI-0. Um, we currently uh, still support, uh, we have Python 2 and Python 3 support for, for GPI-0, um, which will probably probably die out soon. Um, so we, we wouldn't be able to use async IO uh, without deprecating that. And also that uh, as uh, async IO has, um, has, has developed and matured over the last few Python releases, um, once we get a stable async IO that, that will work uh, on, on, on Raspbian, on the, the version of Python that ships with, with the current version of Raspbian, uh, we'll be in a position we'll be able to do that. So it'll be something to look forward to in the future. Um, so you can find more about uh, GPO0 on, on uh, our GitHub. It's on the RPI distro organization. And, um, and on read the doc, so gpio0.readthedocs.io. Um, and just uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, this could be a talk of its own, but um, I've just limited it to, to just the one slide. Uh, PyWheels is a, another project I, I've worked on with Dave. Uh, it's a Python package repository uh, that, that built, automates uh, builds of all the PyPy releases. So every package of every, every version of every package on PyPy, we build an ARM platform wheel for, so that uh, it, they work on the Raspberry Pi. And they're built on Raspberry Pi hardware in uh, the Mythic Beast uh, Pi Cloud, so a, a server hosting company have, has an actual rack of Raspberry Pis. Uh, we automate all the builds of all the packages as they come out. Uh, we have a few manual builds, like we, we, we build OpenCV ourselves uh, offline and import those, and uh, the TensorFlow team at Google are actually providing us with um, their own custom builds of TensorFlow, so you can pip install TensorFlow on a Pi and you get it um, uh, as quick as that. So. Uh, the problem this solves was that um, it used to take a very long time to install packages on Raspberry Pi because you had to build everything from source because the wheels that are provided are for other architectures. So um, we natively compile all these on uh, Raspberry Pi hardware and provide the re repository. Uh, so there's multiple Pis in the, in, the, in, the, in the rack that are doing the building and they just kind of, there's a, a Postgres database that just keeps up with what has been built and what has been attempted. Um, and then provides the uh, provides them all in the repository index, um, and then there's a, just a, one single Raspberry Pi that re receives all the requests and just dishes out files as they're requested. It's pre um, pre configured in Raspbian to use this as an additional index to to PyPy. Um, so it obviously, when it when it has a choice between a source distribution from PyPy and a wheel from uh, a matching platform wheel from PyWheels, uh, it goes for for PyWheels. So uh, reduces your 
install time right down, uh, which is which is really useful for Raspberry Pi users. Uh, but that that single Raspberry Pi hosting um, the packages is is currently serving around three to four hundred thousand wheels a month, um, and it's it's holding up really well. And just to finish off, um, just wanted to talk about a, a few of the programs that we uh, that we run at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So Raspberry Jams is a, a, a is the name for independently organised community events that are held around the world. They're kind of family friendly events, so they're not just workshops for kids. Like the kind of things that. People in this room could go along and work on projects or even take your kids along um, and meet other kind of makers, electronics uh, enthusiasts, hackers and engineers and other programmers and all sorts of beginners as well. Um, uh, they're, they're really uh, great fun events. They're a mix of kind of, some of them are, are like meetups, some of them are kind of more like a conference where they have speakers and talks and presentations. Some of them are kind of allow you to drop in and do workshops or work on your own projects. Uh, so yeah, if you head to raspberrypi.org, uh, the Jam page has a map and calendar of upcoming events. And also, um, Coded Dojo is uh, another program we run, which is uh, for under 18 uh, kids. So um, that's a way of, uh, that you could you could join in by volunteering as a mentor and actually help teaching kids in a in a kind of a youth club uh, to learn programming skills in uh, across any technology um, on Raspberry Pis or or on laptops using micro bits or, or anything. Um, uh, and if, if there's no uh, existing dojo in the, the area you live, they're really easy to set up and just a few, few people volunteering some time, uh, a couple of hours once a month, something like that would be uh, a great way to provide the kids in, in your area a way to uh, learn some programming skills and get interested in using um, and learning technology. Uh, and finally, um, I'm presenting a poster um, just through in the in the, the main room there today. So um, if you want to come and read more about um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation and um, and the Raspberry Pi and Python world, uh, and come and talk to me and um, answer, I'll answer any questions you've got or discuss any anything with you. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have some time for QA. So first one. Yeah. Hello. Oh, thanks for the talk. Um, you showed these four alternatives for interacting with the the I/O pins. Is there any relevant uh, concern about power consumption or any relevant difference among them? Um, there, there will be. I won't say there won't. There, there isn't any. Uh, but it's, in my experience, um, it's not really caused any problems. So I think, yeah, one time I noticed some, you know, there was something running where um, there was something like 25 LEDs on a, on a Christmas tree, and each of them had had their source set to a, a, the random value, so they all sort of sparkled. And be because each one of them was generating random numbers in a background thread, and there are 25 of them, and it was actually running on a Pi Zero, so a 700 megahertz, you know, the, the early, um, which is the, the chip that was in the Pi 1, so a very, very um, weak pro processor compared to what we have with the Pi 3 and 3 Plus today. Uh, yeah, it started to sort of, well, it, it worked fine, but if you tried to open a web browser on the Pi at the same time, you'd have, you'd have really struggled. Uh, it would have been eating up a lot of RAM, but yeah, you have to do quite a lot to make that work, and it's very simple to refactor that, the code in that example to, to run more efficiently just by setting the source to, say, uh, a 26 tuple of random values rather than each of them doing it in their own background thread, for instance. But yeah, it's not really been a problem. I mean, blocking is quite a good way of, you know, in, when you've got those while loops. I mean, people do that all the time um, in projects because it's the easiest way that they think of to have something continuously update. So they're constantly checking something, not even putting a sleep in it. It's fine. Um, I think I prefer the blocking way just because it feels like you're, um, you're just restricting the amount of stuff that needs to happen. Um, but yeah, I can, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, but um, not a not a horrendous concern. Uh, some people probably not like the idea of that many threads going on, but um, it's they're very very simple threads. They're not doing loads of stuff in the global namespace or anything like that. They're um, they're just doing having one very small job just to pass messages around. So yeah. hi. Uh, so thanks for like um, sending us this GPIO zero. I I see that it provides a lot of like great structure for the uh, for the applications for the software on um, Raspberry Pi. But my question is, uh, as you actually mentioned yourself, uh, Raspberry Pi is quite powerful. 
and maybe for some users it's too powerful, actually, and using too much power. Do you think that you could uh, possibly run the same uh, library or like maybe strip down, um, for example, MicroPython uh, devices? Because this was this is actually my use case, which I would very like to 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 go with. Yeah. So um, I'm going to call on Carlos in a minute. Um, so the API to the on the MicroPython API for the micro bit, um, we kind of um, there's a group of people that worked on that, and I I, um, I remember in the early days actually conversations with Damon George around that API was kind of what led me to towards devising something um, a nicer API like this, um, and. It, that, that API is quite nice. Um, it's not got some of the features that um, that this has because you 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 don't have um, you know the the resource uh, resources available to do the you know back, background threading thing. I don't know, know if Pi MicroPython supports threading, does it? No. Um, so you you couldn't do some of those callbacks and things. So you you will see kids writing MicroPython scripts on the micro bit that uh, that are just doing the while loops all the time. And, and things like the way that we uh, use properties quite heavily. So setting properties is quite, you, usually you see getters and setters and things like that, um, even in Python. Um, I really, really like being able to use that, that style to just declare something. Um, so you, the same way you would set a, you know, a equals one, I want to be able to say the LED value should be true or, or should be uh, something like that. So I really like being able to do that as well as um, and, and uh, as well as use the use the methods and things, but um, I don't think you can really get away with doing that, you know, with properties and in MicroPython as well. Um, but I think you can get you can get quite close, and you um, you just don't have the uh, luxury of being able to do a lot of that stuff. But yeah, you can make some nice APIs that uh, use some of the uh, the beginner stuff in that I showed you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, you showed a function in the middle between the, um, the inputs and, and, and the outputs in effect. How, and, but, and you showed quite simple ones, but presumably you could have really complex ones yeah. where you're doing uh, machine learning processing or I, I don't know, yeah. something quite complex to. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and that would, how, how, how complex can you get and still have this stuff working in, in real time? I mean, some of them are uh, more complex in that, like the the Energini lamp is kind of controlling mains power. So you actually, it's still very simple, and you're just turning a few GPIO pins on. It sends a signal to the to the socket and actually turn. But you could have that could doesn't have to be a lamp. That's a glorified LED, you know, in a way, in that you're just still turning a light on. Um, it just happens to be more powerful a light, and it's a heat lamp. Um, but that could be controlling something more critical, like some sort of machinery or something. But um, um, I mean, there are, there are some really interesting GPIO components that you can use, things like ultrasonic distance sensors. So you could have, if this was the sensor, I could be uh, waving my hand in front of it, and you can graph the value of the, uh, the distance because it's constantly reading how far away the object is by sending a sonar um, pulse and reading the value back. Um, and it just means you can, do, you can do some interesting things like that, like how many LEDs you light up according to how close you get, or tell them the motors of a robot to stop when they get to a... Um, when they get to a wall or to, um, like the, there's an example I wrote for, for Blue Dot controlling a robot. So actually having a little robot with just, just motors and sensors attached to a Raspberry Pi on, uh, on wheels on a little chassis. But using the Blue Dot, so you, pa you pass in the, um, the coordinates of where your thumb is on the, um, on the dot, pass those in and sort of clamp them and, and you know, do, uh, apply a couple of functions. I forget what they were now. Um, clamp them and scale them, I think. It's so that they're in the same thing that um, your your motors uh, and you're you're not just passing in go forward and go backwards. You're passing in speeds of the left and right motor. Uh, it's still very simple, but it's sort of a progression towards a uh, showing you what what you can do. Um, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of different electronic components that um, you know you can control things like LCD screens or um, um, and all sorts of different sensors, but that. Um, yeah, a lot of the examples are just LEDs and buttons, which is it's the most simple thing to exp to explain it with. But um, yeah, you can do some really interesting stuff with with other components, and you can write your own classes, for instance, that control something else entirely. So 
and use the same kind of kind of API. Thank you. Yeah, coming back to the question of uh, polling versus um, blocking, um, I was wondering if the Pi's GPIO pins uh, support hardware interrupts and whether you guys um, have used them or are planning to integrate them. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. I think there's a certain amount of, um, because it's happening in Linux, right? It's not like a, you're not talking to a microcontroller. Um, so it's, yeah, there are system level interrupts. Um, I think that's how they're implemented in the, I don't touch the underlying libraries really, so, but I believe so, yeah. Um, you can certainly do, um, you, there certainly are, uh, are ways of, of doing, yeah, complete system interrupts at that level, yeah. I think we have time for one last question, or, okay, I think we're fine. Thank you so much. Thanks.